Hi, my name is Ken Soban. I live in Chico, California, and uh, I sit on the California board for California Audubon, and I represent Northern California. Uh, I'm also on the board for uh, Chico's Audubon um, called AltaCal. Now, uh, I also teach middle school. I'm a middle school science teacher. And uh, when I'm not doing all that, I love to work with owls. And the owl that I study is called the Northern Sawwed Owl. So I'll go ahead and put the picture of the owl in and then I'll talk a little bit about it here. So let me share my screen here. So this is the great little owl that I study. I, I didn't take this picture, I wish I would have, but um, it's a beautiful little Northern saw wet owl. Now these owls are fantastic owls. Um, as you can see, they're quite small. If you compare the size of my hand to the size of the owl. And uh, they're considered the most populated or most frequently banded owl. Well, they are the most frequently banded owl in North America and they are uh, the most plentiful owl in North America. Um, you can see their range. They have a year round range in the, the dark purple. And then the darker blue is kind of the non-breeding. And um, then the light is the non-breeding or scarce. So uh, the average age of encounter for these owls, the average age that people ban them is about 1.9 years old. Um, their longevity record. So these owls have lived to uh, 10 years and four months. And that was an owl that was banded and it was rebanded 10 years later. Uh, they breed in the Northern forest and they kind of, if you look at the range, they kind of go all the way up to the boreal regions of Canada. So they breed in the Sierras and the, in California, they breed in the Sierras and the Cascade, usually above 4,300 feet uh, sometimes um, they'll breed a little bit lower, but up to 7,500 feet in elevation. So I'm not sure if you can see the video or not. So pretty, pretty amazing little creature with the blink there. They're typically monogamous, um, one male, one female, but not always. These guys have been known to have a double clutch or even triple clutch. So three, the, what will happen is the males will be on their territory, different parts, maybe lower, there's a, a male on a territory lower in the elevation and then middle elevation and then high elevation. And the female maybe will start with a lower guy um, and breed late winter, then spring um, in the middle elevation. And then um, in the summer, she'll uh, breed with the um, upper elevation. Now that's very rare. Um, but uh, these guys have been known to triple, um, have three clutches. So um, let's see here. Females, they'll incubate average of five to six eggs. Um, and she'll brood um, the young, uh, and then the male will hunt. Then after they hatch, what will happen is they'll switch, which is kind of funny. I think about my, um, you know, when I was working and my wife was staying home with the, with the babies. Um, when I got home, we switched. Well, that's what happens after they hatch. So the female will actually leave the nest and then the male will have to, will take over for a while. So she stays there until they, uh, they hatch and then they switch. So incubation about a month and then they fledge um, about another month. So um, they start flying. So about two months from egg, from laying to incubation, to uh, fledging, leaving the nest. Okay, so the measurements of these guys. These owls show what's called a reverse dimorphism. So um, dimorph, two morphs. So, you know, males in, in humans have uh, male characteristics, females have female characteristics. Well, in, in humans, males are larger and females are a little generally smaller. Well, with these owls, it's the opposite. Um, with these owls, the females are larger and generally they're up to 50% larger than the males. So we can see some small pictures. A picture um, down here, I think I'm pointing at it. That picture there, um, that's a small little male. And we have, uh, well, let's look at this next picture here. Look at that one on the upper left. 
That is a fiery, fierce female. She's uh, pretty fired up there. Um, excellent hunters. So one of their main uh, food sources is this vole. Um, the voles are about 50 grams and a male is only 70 grams. So that's a pretty big meal. Um, so if a male saw wet is, is 70 grams and the vole's 50, you can see the talons there. Um, they also eat um, uh, deer mice. Now their population is, is cyclical. So there tends to be every four years a boom and a bust with, with rodents. So there'll be more um, on the fourth year and then they decrease and then boom, there's a boom. And then they slowly decrease and then the boom. And that's what happens with the owls. They follow their populations, follow that same four year cycle. Now, the calls they make. Well, there's lots of different calls. And let's see if you can hear some of the call. So we got mail call. Okay, so that is a tooting mail call. So we call that a toot rather than a hoop. Now chirps and barks and wails. So you can hear the whales. So you can, you can tell that there's a lot of different calls, 10, 14 different calls, and we'll be hearing those. So when we're out at night banding them, we'll be hearing these calls all around us, wails and screeches um, all around us. So we're part of what's called Project Owlnet. There's around 140 different stations, and you can see our station right here in Northern California, that little dot right there. Um, a colleague of mine just opened another station um, in Blue Lake, uh, kind of uh, Humboldt County over here. This isn't her dot, but there's another one. Uh, another colleague opened one in the Napa area. So we're starting to get some more stations. Um, I've just licensed a uh, sub-permitted abander who's going to be opening um, another station if in um, Reading in Shasta County. We don't have any down south. It would be great to have uh, some, you know, study some saw in the in the Fresno area up in your mountains there. So um, now Project Alnet, we have common goals. We use basically um, the same protocol. So we try to standardize um, our protocol, um, our monitoring methods, even the same call that we use that lure to bring the owls in. Um, so why do we do this? Well, uh, you know, when we first started, um, we, Project Owlnet first started, not very much was known about these owls. Now it is the most studied owl that we, that we have, um, but, there's still so much that's not known about them. The East Coast, because there's so many stations, we know that they tend to breed up in Canada and then move down um, into the Eastern um, part, Southeastern part, and even down to Alabama, they'll move down. But we don't know much about our West Coast population. Um, we know that there's mixing uh, between two populations, but we don't know where exactly our owls are breeding. We figure that some are breeding up in the, the uh, Sierras, but not all of them. Now they've done some mitochondria DNA studies of these owls, and they found that there's no significant difference between the East Coast population and the West Coast population. So that would say that there's mixing. And uh, when we talk later, we did get an owl over here in Iowa. We caught one of their owls. Um, and I'll talk about that recapture later. So there is mixing. And um, do you have any questions right now? Are all the questions the, uh, it wasn't working? Oh, there's one question on what months and time of night do they toot? Okay, so they're calling and tooting in, let's see, probably um, April, May, June, July. Um, we do our monitoring, our surveying in the fall. So we start October 15th, 
to about November 15th, give or take a, a week or so. That's when we're doing our monitoring. And we're playing the call of the male. So they're really puzzled. Why is this male tooting in the fall? So then they come um, to the nets. And we'll talk more about that later. Is there another question? Mixing occurs in Alberta and Manitoba, I assume. Also parts of Saskatchewan, that's a question. Yeah, yeah, so they're, they're breeding up there, but the mixing, those that Saskatchewan bird may come to us. And then next year, they're, they're very transient. That next year, that bird may end up on the East Coast in New York. So they're, they're all over. And, and um, you know, like our birds will follow the Pacific Flyway. These guys are opportunists. They go to where there's food. Um, and so that there's the mixing there. Other question here, well, we're good? I think that's okay. good for now. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Let me find my mouse here. Now this is where uh, the area where I uh, do the research, it's called Big Chico Key Creek Ecological Reserve. So it is part of Chico State. And if you look just up the canyon there on the right, um, if you could look, uh, Mount Lassen would be right there. So this, this uh, Big Chico Creek actually acts like a funnel. And any birds that are kind of going south from Mount Lassen to us, it kind of funnels them towards us. Um, we have three stations at the reserve and most of my study is at Owl 3 at that station there. The net array, um, so we have, what we have is a series of nets. We have three nets at that location and you can see there's a big maple tree um, three nets, net one, two, and three, and 12 meter to, to 18 meter nets. And uh, then the lure, you can see the audio lure, we play that call, the we call that, we play that lure and that brings the owls in. They come to see what's going on. And then the, it's a mist net, um, so it's a very fine net. And what they tend to do is they tend to hit the net and then just fall into a little pocket. We go and check the nets every 30 minutes. So they're not in there for a really long time. So we check the nets and then we'll bring them up to the, up to the station. And then here's, I'm just gonna show you part of a video here. Good evening, my name is Ken Sobon and I'm gonna show you some of the procedure today uh, for setting up the nets. My wife is filming, so that's why I'm not wearing a mask today. So we get to, to be, you know, normal. So right now we're gonna be walking down to the nets and if you can see, we've got a trail. The nets are down in the trees there. So we're gonna walk down and set up the nets. So now that it's dark, you can really see the pockets that uh, the bird will fall into. Um, and you can also hear our collar. So up here in the distance, you can see the collar. That's playing the call for a male Northern Sawwood Owl. And uh, that lures the owls into these nets. So this is our banding table and here's some of the equipment that we use. We can see here is the banding pliers. That closes the bands on their legs. Here's a gauge for measuring the size of the leg. Um, a black light and that's for illuminating the underside of the wing which we'll talk about and you'll see some pictures of it later. Um, a gauge or a ruler basically for measuring um, the length of the wing cord, a scale for weighing it, and, um, and that's really about it, about the tools that we have. Here are the bands that we put on their legs. You can see a little slit, and that slit is how it opens up to be removed from the string. On there you can also see some numbers, some numbers on those bands, and those numbers are a unique number that when you report that number to the USGS, um, they can tell you where that bird was banded, how old it was, and uh, what year it was banded. <clears throat> okay, so I've got an owl in the bag here. So I'm gonna feel through the bag, just if I can see which way he's facing. It looks like so he's facing this way, his eyes are looking, and that's where his bill is. So I'm gonna come in behind him, and then hold him <clears throat> in what we call is a bander's grip. So I'm holding the wings down. And then I'm gonna slide them out. And there he is right there. So, 
sweet little guy. This is a northern sawwet owl. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put a band on his leg. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm going to hold his leg out. I've already got the band in the pliers. So I'm going to hold it with these my pinkies. And then I just close a little bit. And I roll it so we don't get feathers stuck in there. And then I open it up. You can see a few feathers in here. So then I just roll it through here. <clears throat> then I'm going to come at it one more time at a different angle with the pliers and close it up completely. Okay. So now it's closed completely. <clears throat> so the next thing I'm going to do, yep, that looks good. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get its wing cord. So I'm going to get the measurement of the wing from basically the wrist to the tip of the wing. I have a mosquito here. <clears throat> so I put the gauge underneath the wing, and I elevate it, and I lift it up, tuck it here. I lift it up so it's not laying flat. I want to keep a natural curve. So it looks like... It's about 140. Okay. <clears throat> so the wing cord is 140. I look at its tail. And it looks like there are three bars of feathers on the tail. So three tail bars. And then I'll look and um, see the age of the feathers. And this looks like it's a hatchier to me. That they're all the same color and same age. Yeah. These could be fresh. So what I'll do is I will look with a black light. And sometimes it's a little bit harder. So I'm going to protect its eyes so it can't, you know, doesn't damage it. But I'm going to look. Yeah, and the feathers are all the same color. So, so it's a hatchier bird. So I was right. And there's the color underneath the wing. It's called porphyrin. It's a chemical in the wing that will kind of oxidize and age. So he's a hatchier because it's, his feathers are all the same age. It was a little bit hard to tell here and here. These look really fresh, but looks like it's a hatchier. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to weigh him. Put him in the cup here. The scale is zeroed out. I tuck its wings in here. I'm going to hold its legs just to keep them calm. And 82.9. So it's kind of light. The range is from about 70 to like 105. 75 to 105. And uh, if you can zoom in on his face, you can kind of see, especially if I don't put quite so much light in there. Beautiful colors, and they're a magnificent creature. The northern sawwood owl. Sometimes when they're really agitated, we'll pet them, and that'll kind of calm them down. But you can see he's not stressed out. He's pretty calm, just letting us do what we need to do. So this is a northern sawwood owl. Okay. Uh, but that just basically walked through some of the process. Now, uh, what I'll do is I'll just uh, talk about what you might have seen. So this is some of the data that we collect. So we collect the band number, um, the species, northern sawwood owl, the age, sex, the wing cord, tail length, tail bars, nearest to tip, the mass, and date and time. Um, but there's two main things that we want to get. Uh, we want to find out, is it a male or female, and how old it is. So we're collecting all this other data and sending it off to USGS, but those are the two main things. We want to find out how old it is, and is it male or is it female. So to sex the male, there's two, there's two uh, measurements that help us figure out if it's a male or female. Because the females are larger, what we'll do is we'll do a wing cord, and that's that measurement right there. And then we go do a mass record its mass. So there's this cool little chart here that helps us figure it out. 
if you look, we've got the masses here. So if the wing chord is, you know, 125 and the mass is equal or less than 85, then it would be a male. So we have a little chart, discriminant analysis, that helps us see whether it's a male or female. So that's one of the main things, to see if it's a male or female. Now we figure out how old it is. So to figure it out how old, well, these owls have a series of feathers. You can see primary 10 to P1, that's what the P stands for, S secondary flight feathers to S13. Those are the flight feathers. Now, when the owl is, let's say the owl hatched in the summer, all those flight feathers will be the exact same age. So they'll be the same color. But the next year, what happened is they molt and they only molt the tips. So the primary feathers over on the tips will be fresh and then the ones in the center will be old. So we'll have fresh near the body and fresh on the tips. And that's a two-year-old bird. And what that does, that kind of makes sense because those are the, you know, that's what's brushing against their body or brushing against a tree as they're flying and chasing prey. So those old outer feathers are replaced. So we can figure out if an owl is two years old. Is it one year? If it's one year or a hatch year, they're all the same. A second year, SY, it would have um, fresh on the tips. So we can see here, this is a hatch year. They're all pretty uniform. Now, uh, you might have seen the black light. Well, we, there's a chemical called porphyrin in the wings. And the porphyrins um, illuminate with a um, ultraviolet light. And uh, they tend to oxidize. Those chemicals oxidize. So the first year, they're really bright. Second year, they're a little less bright. And they kind of uh, lose their, their, you know, their brightness. So this, would, this confirms that these are all the same age feathers. And I'll show you when we compare it, you can see. So this is a hatch year. Now, a second year bird, a bird that's two years old, has fresh feathers on the tip, fresh in the body. I'm sorry. Yeah, fresh on the tips and then old in the inside. So this feathers on the inside are old. So that tells us it's a second year bird. Now look at the difference of the porphyrins there glow. So the comparison with the, the um, older feathers in the center, fresh feathers on the top. So sometimes it's really hard to tell um, by just looking at the feathers. And if we put it under a black light, it, um, it helps. Now a third year. So the first year, they're all the same. Second year, fresh on the tips. A third year, now it just replaces as needed. So if we see a bird, this bird has three generations of feathers. So we see fresh, you know, very old. We have some fresh in here and some old. So it just replaces. So if we see a bird like that, we know that it's at least uh, a third year bird. Um, but then after three years, we really can't tell other than by looking at a, a band. Now there is an example of a third year bird. So you've got fresh and old and fresh. Any questions about that process here? Let's look at the chat here. Yep, that's the Rockefeller Center owl. Yep, that's exactly that one. Any uh, other questions here? Is that called asynchronous molting? Um, I don't think so. Um, I haven't, I'm not sure what that term, but I think they do follow uh, a synchronous pattern, tips. Um, but I'd have to look that one up. Is there something else here? A question on how, who was, or why did they start using black light? Who, who came up with the idea of using black light on wings? Yeah, isn't that amazing? Yeah, I'm not sure who the first one was, but um, you know, what, by doing that, uh, they helped us, you know, I'm not sure who the first one was. Other questions on there? I think that's all for now. Yeah, they seem very cooperative. Yeah, um, there, you can saw, you saw maybe in the video, I'm not so sure. There is not a, um, uh, they're not fighting and struggling. They can, tend to be pretty docile. And you can actually, if you're really careful, you can actually sneak up to a saw wet 
and pick it off a tree. Now, if you're real careful and you sneak up onto it, um, you know, I, I think they've evolved to have a basically a freeze and hold still. Now, they're predators, maybe other hawks or owls or something like that, a Cooper's hawk. Um, you know, if they fly away, they'll nab them. So they survive better if they just hold still. Um, the difference in feather structure in an owl versus noisier feathers. So with the I'm not sure what you mean by that. Um, why do older feathers not show up? Yeah, that porphyrin oxidizes. So that glow, that chemical, porphyrin oxidizes and glows. And uh, so next year it'll be a little, you know, every year it fades a little bit. Okay, so how do we do? Well, this year we had a pretty good, are the no, are the, uh, Questions aren't in front of the screen, are they? The you have the full screen? Yes. Full screen? Okay. And see, my, the, see the chart. My questions. Okay. So here's the chart. So we had a pretty good year, over a hundred um, owls. And um, what we do is when we look at these numbers, we can compare. So right now we had a great year in 2017, and then it started to decrease. And this year should have been a really good year, but I think what we'll do, hopefully next year we'll have a big bumper year. Um, 2018 was the year that of uh, the um, fire, um, the Paradise Campfire. So we had to end earlier, so it might have been a little bit better. Um, when we look at our numbers, our hour net hours, that that was a really good year. 26. Um, owls per net hours. And that's how we really compare. If we look at that bottom number on the chart, that's really how we compare um, uh, how, you know, the productive, you know, how productive that season was. So if we look at our numbers, we got more owls, but we were up out more nights. So better weather, less rain. And so we're out more nights. Now the full moon does affect, and you can see that there is a pattern, a full moon. Um, and that could be partially because the owls um, maybe see the nets um, and react to them in that way. Now, if we look, here's a chart of all the data. And as I showed, probably the most um, important is that net hours number. Now, when we're banding, the real prize is to capture an owl that has a band on it. When we get that, we are very excited. That is our big prize. In, since 2005, when we opened up, we've banded over 1,200 owls, and we've only had three owls that have come from another station. So um, this first one here, owl research in, in, in Montana. So Bitterroot Valley um, Owl Center. Um, and that owl flew to us, and I think it was in 35 days. He was banded, and 35 days later, he flew to us. Um, our second one was Hitchcock Nature Center in Iowa. That owl came to us a year later. So that owl maybe flew south and then back north and then came to us. And the third one just happened last year. And that guy came from British Columbia. So when Don Garcia started this station, one of the, her, one of the things that she wanted to prove that what, there was a route that these owls tend to go north-south. So we're seeing some north-south, but not always. So one in British Columbia. Now we've had one, one of our banded owls get captured, only one. And he was captured, or she was captured up on um, Rocky Point Bird Observatory, right in the tip of the Juan de Fuca Strait there. It's a kind of a natural funnel. And we've only had one capture there. Okay, three owls banded, captured. Out of how many? Uh, yeah, how many? Um, we've we have one station that runs at a time. We've banded over a thousand owls, um, twelve hundred owls, and we've only had um, three of our owl or one of our owls captured, and we've captured three other owls. Where's the Juan de Fuca Strait? So if you can see, it is in British Columbia, um, but in that white arrow there, the white arrow on the left side of the map. Now, if you ever find an owl or a bird that has a band, 
if you send that um, uh, information into the bird banding laboratory, you get this little certificate, um, whether it's a duck or something else. Now, um, one of the things we wanted to know is where these owls were breeding, where are they coming from? So what we did is we set up, uh, we built about 20 nest boxes. I wanted to see if they were actually nesting in our reserve, uh, about 17, 1800 feet in elevation. Um, now we've not had any sawwets nest but we've had um, screech owls, Western screech owls. And if you, um, you can see the picture on the right-hand side, little fuzz balls there. We've also placed six nest boxes up in uh, Plumas National Forest. And none of those nest boxes were burnt with the last fire. It kind of came up to the area. So I'll need to do some, um, you know, go clean them out and check them out this season. But we have not had any nesting sawwets yet. Okay, so look at, you can see the mama and then the babies. Here's the Western screech owl. So these little babies are little alien looking guys, little cute little owlets. And then there's the mama facing up. So these uh, just about fledging age. So what we did is this is the age that I can put a band on their leg. So I put a band on their leg. I've banded 12 owls from this one box. This mama has used this box four years in a row, which is pretty amazing. So I put this box up four years in a row, she's used it. Um, you know, I've basically, I put a band on her the first year and I keep on checking and it's her. Um, and then um, what uh, we can see the little alien banded. Now there's a video one I'm gonna try to do is skip this video and not play it. see if I can skip it. Okay, good. I skipped it. So not, oh, I went too far now. So not just owls. Um, sometimes we'll get a flying squirrel. So this flying squirrel was nesting, uh, was using the nest box. So I stuck my little GoPro camera in the nest box and out scurried this little flying squirrel. And you can see the little flaps of skin um, by its, uh, you know, between its legs there. Um, here's a picture of a flying squirrel here. And there's a little video. Um, that's a little baby on the left. There's a video, but I'm not going to show that video. So let's see if I can skip it. Okay, so we can saw it. it was the removal. Um, it's cute because he did um, kind of hop away, but I'm not going to show that. Um, so there's a flying squirrel nest. That's what they look like. Um, lots of like, um, so, um, you know, staghorn lichen and um, bark and all kinds of stuff. And then uh, astro and flycatchers will sometimes use our, um, our nest boxes. Um, okay, so question here are, saw so what owl individuals you ban residents? Now these are migrating, these are coming through, no residents. Um, so part of the study, I wanted to see if some will stay in. At our elevation, um, these are all migrants that come through. So sometimes we'll get bats. Uh, here is a pallid bat. Pallid means pale, so you can see how pale its body is. Now, we don't want to get a bat. It is not fun to remove them. Um, you see those little holes? Well, they, uh, their teeth can't go through the glove, but uh, Friday the 13th, two years ago, I got bit through one of those holes. So I had to get rabies shots, and that wasn't fun. Mm. So pallid bats will sometimes hit our nets because one of their favorite food sources are those um, Jerusalem crickets or um, uh, there's different names for them. Uh, Tierra, uh, Spanish culture has a, a name for them, child of the earth. Um, but they like to eat these. So what they'll do is they'll kind of turn off their sonar to eat these guys. And then they'll hit the nets because they're flying that low. Um, sometimes we'll get um, well, we didn't catch this guy, but uh, ringtail cat one night I heard uh, some scurrying and uh, there was a uh, ringtail cat in the tree. Just a, uh, yeah, Nina de Tierra. Nino, yeah. And then let's skip the video. So we have a couple of volunteers here. There's a little video here of her <laughs> loving on the owl. A couple more of my volunteers. So the ringtail cat. 
Um, that was at our reserve. And uh, yep, uh, North America. So just outside of uh, Chico. Now, if you're interested in supporting us, um, altacal.org, um, there's a little donate button. Um, forgive the, we're reworking our website. It's a little clunky. There's some weird characters. We've got a new web designer doing that. But if you'd like to support the project, if you'd like to come and visit in the fall, you're welcome to just contact me. Um, but if you'd love to hit the donate, um, I do, you're welcome to, to go to the website, hit donate in the notes, put Northern Sawwood Owl. So now I have time for some more questions. That's really all the program. I, the videos would have taken a little bit longer, but um, unstable internet. Yes, altacal.org. Altacal.org. And um, Robert, would you put altacal.org in the chat here? Sure. Yeah, the whitetail kite, um, that's our Altacal logo. Yep. Okay, so any other questions? Hopefully you found that interesting and enjoyed it. These are saw wet babies. I didn't take this picture. I wish I would have. Someday we'll, uh, we'll get some saw wets nesting. A few more questions coming in. How far are, is the preserve from Paradise? So the reserve is about uh, maybe 12, 13 miles um, as an owl would fly just north of Paradise. So the reserve is just the next ridge over um, from Paradise, just below Forest Ranch. What are your suggestions for students or recent graduates who want to get involved in owl research? Oh, gosh, you know what, volunteer. And uh, for volunteers, I always have to limit my volunteers, but I definitely show a preference to, um, to students um, who need a, you know, on the resume. So contact me. And uh, I'd love to have you come and volunteer. We're going to be doing some, um, some spring banding. My colleague up in Reading, um, who I just licensed, um, she will be opening a station up there. And um, so there might be some spring banding um, at our station too. How many eggs do they usually have? Um, what, four, five, four to six eggs? Um, and there's a question about a squirrel. I didn't see that one. I can end the. If the squirrel's in the nest box, what happens when the owl shows up? I don't think the owl would show up. Yeah, the owl knows that someone's in there. Um, yeah, the owl. The the basically it's a, now it's a squirrel box, and uh, not an owl box. Oh uh, yeah, birdbling.com. Yeah, that's the blog. I'm not much of a blogger. Um, I don't have a lot of time with teaching and. COVID and things like that. So uh, I haven't been updating it, but birdbling.com um, and blogspot, that is our blog here. Um, what type of habit do they prefer? Yeah, they, they're forced out. Yeah, so they do prefer the, the, the boreal to forest that we have here. So um, enough cover that they can fly around in the trees and um, uh, get their voles and deer mice. And there was a question about owl oh, squirrels. Paradise Reserve. Yes, they do fly very quiet. Um, you'll never hear an owl fly. Um, even when we release them and they take off, they fly up just like it, it's almost like a little moth going straight up, very silent. Let's see, um, others. Uh, Circumpolar, do they? Uh, no, they're they're pretty much North American. Yeah, they stay there. Uh, in Houston, no, I have not been to the International Owl Center in Houston. I bet it's pretty pretty neat. I'd love to go to that. Any other new question? So actually, I don't teach at Chico State. I am a uh, middle school teacher. I teach middle school science. Um, in Oroville. So little, uh, you know, middle school kids, the fun ones. So people think I'm either crazy or yeah, you got to be a little crazy to teach middle school, but I love it. Um, Sawets, April to July. They're tuning in Canada. You can even find them up in the Sierras. 
um, you know, just go uphill, uh, what probably, um, uh, what's the closest mountains to where you are? So in, in Fresno, what, um, Yosemite up there. So in the spring and summer, they're up there tooting away. A lot of birders in the middle. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, you know what the pygmy, the northern pygmy owl is a, a single toot about every one to two seconds. So it's like, And then sawwits are, so they kind of follow that pat pattern. Now, which is interesting, we don't get pygmies, they are not lured, they're all around us. When we're opening the nets, we'll um, hear pygmy owls uh, just at dusk, we'll hear pygmy owls, but they are not lured in by the calls. Sometimes we'll get uh, screech owls, screech owls are lured in. We even tried to play pygmy calls and we don't catch pygmies. Um, you know, if they can overwinter, Southern Ontario, you know what, some, some of the males are known to stay on um, their nest. So what they'll do is if they've got a nice nest cavity, so they're cavity nesters, they're not gonna leave their cavity. So some are known to hang out in the snow. But uh, what's interesting is these guys are cavity nesters, but not their, they're not cavity roosters. So like a, um, uh, a Western screech owl will actually roost in the cavity. So they'll spend the night inside their hole. Um, but uh, sawwits will only um, roost, they'll roost on a tree and then they'll nest in the cavity. Yep, uh, yep, Northern pygmy owls, diurnal do screech owls compete? Yeah. Not so much. I mean, I, I guess they would compete. You know, screech owls, they don't go quite as high. So that could be another reason why um, we're not getting uh, the sawwits nesting in our reserve is because we have several good nesting pairs of screech owls in the reserve. So we might have to go a little bit higher to get those. You're welcome to the presentation tonight. So you're welcome. Please go on to altacal.org, make a donation. Thank you for giving me the opportunity um, it's really exciting to be able to do this and love to have you come out and visit and, um, um, and support. Thank you.